Although the subject of a now relatively old DLC, Denmark has always been an extremely powerful but tenuous nation, with the wily Sweden just waiting for an opportunity to break free. Denmark is easily overwhelmed if it shows even a modicum of weakness, but a competent player can simply never find themselves in a position of weakness and take Denmark to insane heights. Whether it's dismantling the archaic Holy Roman Empire, colonizing the New World and India, or establishing a brand new North Sea Empire, Denmark really has no limits. Its mission tree focuses on the placation of its subjects, control over the Baltic and North Sea, and a bit of colonization, but any savvy EU4 player knows that no nation is limited to just its singular mission tree. Indeed, Denmark is in the unique position to very easily change nations whenever they please on account of their relatively low core development. Denmark's power comes from its position, its income, and its subjects, more so than direct development, which means switching cultures isn't too hard. For that reason, I'll be taking Denmark on a journey through its ever-evolving position as the dominant power of the seas. They can go anywhere once they've got their feet off the ground, but there are certainly some more obvious choices than others. Let's get into how to play Denmark. Your first priority as Denmark is actually to not do anything for a little while. You need to ensure you've got Swedish and Norwegian loyalty, and of course, we're going to exploit both crowns because we're not weak. I'm going to do my usual estate strategy, which is one of caution. I'm only taking the extra military point privilege alongside the usual picks. Here's what it looks like. But as I normally say in these guides, there's not really a need for an extremely particular estate choice. We're not going for anything nearly meta enough to nitpick over estates. For rivals, I've got England, Scotland, and Novgorod. And for alliances, this is where one of Denmark's special abilities comes through. We have an insane number of relationship slots. Start the game with six slots, although three are already taken. We'll be freeing up one of those slots pretty soon, but by using the strong duchy's privilege we get up to 8 slots and later we'll get yet another slot once you ratify the Kalmar Union for a whopping 9 slots before any idea groups. We keep those slots after integrating our unions too. I'm going to ally a ton of nations which I will use for my own interests. First off, Poland, who I have to improve relations with first. We're going to improve with France as well, though I'm not sure if I'll actually go with them or not. For the first war, I'm going to take the island of Gotland back before they can pirate raid all my land, and this war is entirely uneventful, as Gotland is way too weak to be a threat. You can release Gotland as a little pirate republic to harass people if you want, but nah, I want my relationship slot. From here, we won't be going to war again for about a decade, since I just need to improve relations with Sweden and Norway and get my allies. I got Poland as a friend in 1447, but they didn't take the union with Lithuania, so they're less useful than they normally be. In terms of other alliances, I was iffy on whether I wanted to become the Emperor or destroy the Empire, so I allied the Electors, since either way I'll need to do that. I got Brandenburg, Cologne, and the Palatinate, and I've got space for one more. While figuring out who to ally, I got the Crown of Norway mission, and this is where you can decide whether to get positive modifiers at the cost of Liberty Desire, or penalties to get reduced Liberty Desire. Real Gigachads always exploit the Crown for good modifiers. Using Norway's Crown, you get Manpower Recovery, Sailor Recovery, and a whopping 25% Goods Produced modifier. It does make Norway a historical rival though, but quite frankly they will never escape our control, so who cares. I completed the rival England mission shortly after, but to do the next mission I'll need more ships and I don't have the income to go over my naval force limit, nor do I even have the sailors to get a flagship, so I can't rush down England. I was thinking about making that my strategy, but we'll go for a more traditional opening instead. I gave Sweden some development and loyalist support in 1448 to get the Libyas low enough to do the Crown of Sweden mission. Obviously, we'll be exploiting the Swedes for yet another goods produced modifier and a trade efficiency modifier, alongside some smaller modifiers since, man, those are some awesome bonuses. This does make Sweden disloyal, but we just give them a little bit of development to hold them over and we've got nothing to worry about. Quite frankly, developing subjects is, although a bit wasteful of points, a way to ensure complete loyalty for decades. The developed provinces Libya's our modifier wears off relatively slowly, and it's definitely worth it since we'll have a massive abundance of points as Denmark, thanks to our relatively slow conquest in the early years of the game. My luck was in the green with a 5-3-3 event error a year later, and I also lost Novgorod as a rival since Muscovy gutted them. I don't really want to rival Burgundy or Lithuania, so I guess I'll just rival Venice and ignore them. From here, I did easy estate missions and built up some money. One little tip, make sure to transfer trade from Holstein. They actually sap quite a bit of trade with their center of trade, and it would be better served in your hands. I annexed Holstein as soon as I could, and by 1455 I was feeling just about ready to get warring. The mission Expand the Military requires 12 galleys, which means I'll have to go over my force limit, but that's okay because I'm actually pretty rich, and the power I'll gain from the claims that mission grants me will be worth it. To be open with you guys, I'm pretty sure I could have done this mission much earlier, but I was apprehensive because although I normally do test games for these guides, for this one I just dropped in as Denmark and got a pretty good run going in one try and decided to go with it. I got my first idea group in 1457, and I decided to make a controversial decision. I'm taking innovative ideas. 
By no means at all do I consider myself an extremely skilled EU4 player, although I think I'm not half bad. I am already aware of the Reddit discourse on innovative ideas, and I'm only taking it because I felt lazy and wanted to have a pseudo-tall run as Denmark. My ticket innovative is that it's a guardrail against mistakes. Did you inefficiently spend your monarch points? Well, everything's cheaper, so it's okay. Can't run a strong enough economy for lo-fi advisors? Well, they're all cheaper, and so on. Check out England over here getting occupied by an Irish nation. Nice. Anyway, I completed the mission of 457, and then I saw that I could pretty easily complete the Humiliate Lubeck mission since all I need is trade power, so I did that mission too right away. Enough peace and preparation though, it's been far too long of a wait. Let's go invade the Baltic States. I got lucky with the Livonian Orders alliances, as I have an opportunity to make huge strides in my control over Lubeck and the Baltic. Livonia is allied to Riga, who is allied to Lubeck and Hamburg. That means I can attack the Hanseatic League without getting the Emperor in the war. I'm going to call in Poland and Brandenburg to carry me in this war, and I'm going to make the Teutonic Order and Riga co-belligerents. I could co-belligerent Lubeck and Hamburg, but I don't want to fight Austria, so I'm good. The war broke out, and initially my army was defeated in Holstein by all the minor nation armies, but I've got much more manpower to burn through than they do. Once Norway and Sweden marched down, our combined might scared off the League, and now we're working on sieging down these Hanseatic cities. There's another mission I can accomplish if I blockade a certain set of cities, which I can do in this war, so I'm going to get yet another mission done. This mission gives me a huge amount of money and permanent trade power in the inland German trade notes. I finished occupying Hamburg and Lubeck, and now I could separate piece them and take massive aggressive expansion in return for the best trade centers in Lubeck, but I'm a bit wary of a massive coalition, so I only took Hamburg. At least one of the cities will greatly help, but two would just be greedy. I took Riga on a separate piece, and then let my allies mop up the Livonians, who I fully annexed. Because Livonia is far from the Empire, I didn't get much aggressive expansion. This let me complete the Reconquer Estonia mission, granting me claims to Novgorod. For just a moment, Sweden became disloyal, which I promptly fixed, but before the month could update Sweden's attitude, Lithuania supported their independence. A huge pain for sure, but in case you were unaware, you can stop a support independence treaty by just declaring war on the person supporting your subject. I got an opportunity where Poland wasn't willing to defend Lithuania, so I declared war since my most recent missions give me some claims to land Lithuania owns anyway. Immediately, Sweden became loyal again, and since Lithuania was allied to Novgorod, I was able to get some provinces I'd need for my missions. The war ended in 1469 with me granting a bit of land to Sweden and directly conquering my claims. Pretty much immediately after, I declared war on Muscovy using Poland's help. Muscovy only gets stronger the longer you wait, so I'm happy to fight them now while they're a bit weak. The war was uneventful, as with Poland's help, Muscovy was completely overwhelmed. I took my claims, then developed Sealand a bit to get Renaissance, and just because I wanted more force limit. Everything was going pretty smoothly as I just worked on my ideas, but then I got the Brewing Revolution of Sweden event, and since I haven't played any test games, I just picked the Stability option, which has a follow-up event that destroys relations with Sweden. I felt like I was screwed since Union's end if relations aren't positive, even if liberty desire is low, so I had to get Sweden's opinion back up. Easier said than done. I'm just going to have to keep relations improved and hope my king doesn't die before the relations get fixed up. While I'm waiting on that, I saw that England was pretty vulnerable, so I pounced on them, calling in Austria. You might think Austria wouldn't be useful, but since they got the Burgundian inheritance, Burgundy's navy will actually be useful here. England was so weak that their AI destroyed all their forts, presumably to save money, so I'm just landing in Northumberland and chilling. I made 30,000 units and 30 cogs, so I could transport them all at once, expecting resistance. But I could have transported them multiple waves given how little force England has. I just marched south to London and sat there, sieging it uncontested. Then I stack wiped England, killing 9,000 men while taking 750 or so losses. Time to carpet siege and win this war. I'm taking all my claims and liberating Offaly, who I'm going to take as a vassal to rule Ireland for me. With that, I've got myself a little Dane law going, and I definitely could have gotten this done earlier, but again, this playthrough was a first attempt with no tests. For my next war, I decided that the Empire needs to go. Remember in the beginning of the game when I allied most of the electors? Well, Brandenburg won the Empire election at one point, meaning I could just break my alliance with them, send the alliance to Bohemia and Mainz, and then declare war on Lubick to go and end the Empire. I still had my royal marriage, so it cost me one stability, but that's fine. It would be worth it to occupy Berlin and eradicate the massive aggressive expansion that the Empire causes. I called in all my allies and worked my way through Lübeck down to Brandenburg. Berlin fell in 1486, and with it, the Empire was gone. I made separate peace with most of the allies in the war, asking for trade power and money, then annexed Lübeck for myself. After this war, I got my next idea group, which I decided would be trade ideas. It's time to get rich. The conquests don't stop here though, as I've still got some claims on Muscovy to push. I've got fewer troops with better technology, so I'm not scared. I had been playing with a consort regent from Poland for the past 30 or so years because he was extending the regency just because the regent was way better than my heir, and when she passed away, I assumed that I would lose Sweden, whose opinion wasn't quite over zero yet, 
but I guess I learned something new today. Can anyone in the comments confirm this? Do Regent deaths not trigger unions ending due to low relations? I'm not sure if this was a bug or something to do with Regents, so let me know. Either way, I completed the Nobles of Sweden mission, then bumped stability up and completed the Kalmar Union mission. This mission makes having unions as Denmark give some nice bonuses and lets you integrate your unions way faster. It's pretty good, and I'm happy to have it, but it's not super amazing to be honest. It's just pretty good. Anyway, I didn't want much from Muscovy, so I ended the war with 20 war score and took my claims. I got called into some war by Austria, but just sat around not helping, like a good ally. They really didn't need my help anyway. I was able to vassalize what remained of Brandenburg, which is great because I can feed them cores, and they've got a great mission tree I can use to conquer most of Germany for them. My next war that Austria didn't call me into was against England. I've got to complete my conquest of England so I can control more of the English Channel and make huge money. Never be afraid to collect from trade outside of your main trade node, since whether you have a negative trade power from collecting or not, more money is more money, and you can always shore up your disadvantage by just controlling all the land. I took Bremen in a separate piece, and then completely destroyed England, taking all their valuable eastern provinces, including their last four, London. I was also fighting in Ireland to take some land for my vassal of Offaly. Scotland was allied to them, so I took the opportunity to take their fort in Dumfries during the war. Without even intending to, I completed the German mercenaries mission, which just gives access to some unique mercenary companies. I don't really like using a lot of mercenaries beyond the early game because they don't tend to have a lot of artillery. Artillery is good for sieges and doing heavy damage as we approach the mid to late game, so I don't care much for it, but there are more mercenary missions, so I'll hire some and get the mission complete. The year is now 1504, we're starting to run out of time in the Age of Discovery, but I was feeling kind of bored, so I went for a humiliation war on Muscovy. They're weak and I can easily get a nice show strength war goal for a bunch of monarch points and power projection. Obviously this war goal won't really harm Muscovy much, but I just wanted to assert dominance like a Giga Chad. During the war, the Protestant Reformation began in 1506 in Meister to Offaly, funnily enough. I finished my war, showing strength through Musk in 1508, so I was feeling good. My next war was for Brandenburg's claims in Pomerania, and at this point I'm just conquering everything I can. Although the Empire is gone, aggressive expansion is still a thing, and I can certainly get a coalition if I'm not cautious. I attacked Bohemia and Rupin for more Brandenburg cores, and I've got a pretty solid footing in north to eastern Germany. With a couple more years left, I declared war in England to take even more land from them, and I'm getting pretty aggressive here. France is already considering joining a coalition against me, and I'm only barely keeping their opinion above 50 to prevent that. If I take too much English land, France will come after me. I finished the war in 1515, just before the end of the Era of Discovery, and I've relegated England to the West Midlands and Wales. Poor England. I moved my capital over to London through the Conquer England mission, which means I now collect trade in the English Channel much more efficiently. I'm still going to collect in Lubick, but since I have more power there than in the English Channel, it'll work out to more money this way. One more quick war for Ireland and Irishshire, and the Age of Reformation began mid-war. Normally I do each of these guys as a sort of era by era guide, but I'm actually going to keep this going because we haven't really accomplished anything too mind-blowing as Denmark here. Let's get a little creative and do some crazy plays in the Age of Reformation. I want to complete most of Denmark's mission tree before we do anything drastic, but I'm considering where to go next. I can focus on Germany, I can look to Russia, or do some colonization. There are all kinds of options for me, but I'm thinking that Denmark's mission tree just isn't enough for me. I've conquered England, and once I finish them off, I'll have a pretty massive share of English culture. Hmm. Perhaps a North Sea Empire under England rather than Denmark? Although I think I prefer Denmark's ideas, so I'll probably keep those. First off, to complete the Danish missions, I need to annex Norway and Sweden. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier, by the way, but I took quantity ideas since I have a massive economy and I need more men. Quantity is always a good pick, but it's especially good for higher income nations that can afford to build that many soldiers. In 1520, Burgundy declared an independence war in Austria, and I was called in. It would have made me lose my alliance with Poland, and quite frankly, I want Burgundy to be free, so I'm just going to reject that call to arms. Sorry, Austria. After Burgundy got free, I allied them and married them, thinking that perhaps I'll be able to get a union on them if I'm lucky, but most likely I won't and I'll have to fight them for control over the English Channel. Another war for more English land in 1530 and I'll be fully annexing them in this war, and during the war I embraced colonialism, which lets me get a free colonist through Denmark's missions. This is actually pretty great since I don't have to take any ideas to start colonizing. England was annexed in 1532, and now I can form England in theory whenever I'm ready, but I have a few more missions to complete. First, I integrated Norway, who had a colony in South America, so that's pretty cool. Then I had the Count's Feud disaster, which I easily put down, and during which I integrated Sweden. I have Unified Scandinavia, which gives me a hefty maximum absolutism modifier. I could immediately form Scandinavia, but that would prevent me from forming England, so I will not be doing that. With the Reformation blazing, I have to decide what religion I want to go with, and I'm thinking to stick with Catholicism, so I'm going to embrace the Counter-Reformation and go down the Catholic Mission Tree branch of Denmark, but to be honest, there aren't any super good missions there, so I'll skip on most of them, I think. I completed the Mercenary Army mission for some mercenary discipline, and then promptly got rid of most of my mercenaries since I just don't need them, I only got them for the mission. 
In 1558, I completed the Revoke the Privileges mission and alongside it, the Danish Absolutism mission, which gives even more a maximum Absolutism. At this rate, I'll be able to max out my Absolutism even with state privileges granted. You're probably noticing that I'm skipping ahead a lot in the timeline, that's mostly because not much is happening. I'm dealing with a coalition that's relatively strong and waiting for it to go away. I vassalize nations like Saxony, Würzburg, and the Palatinate, just so I can still be sort of expanding, but I'm fully intending to just work on my missions and wait until I get everything I want before becoming England. So let's skip a little further ahead to 1565, where I finally decided to take the jump to England. I used the extra monarch points I have been storing up thanks to innovative ideas to develop England to 50% of my state culture share, and now I can form England. The only thing that sucks about this is that I lose the Kalmar monarchy government reform, in exchange for the English monarchy. English monarchy isn't too bad, but those diplomatic relations slots from Denmark's reform are very useful for some of all the vassals I've got. The first thing I'm doing as England is getting those sweet Angevin Empire missions. That means I get a Union CB on France, and boy, that's a massive France to take over. Using my alliance with Poland, Burgundy, and my remade alliance with Austria, I will defeat the French Ottoman alliance in a pretty massive war that ultimately I'm just going to let the AI handle while I focus on taking Paris. In terms of defining exactly what the culture of an empire like this is, I guess it's an anglicized Danelaw Norman Empire or something? Our culture is English, but we were originally Danish. We've made claims of Angevin heritage and are trying to take France for the English crown. Now, what I'm thinking is, we can just go back to Danish culture once we do all the Angevin missions we want to do, and then become Scandinavia for a proper Dane law, but that'll come later. For now, let's focus on defeating France. Thanks to the crusade against the Ottomans, I've got some cool modifiers for the duration of the war. I landed my armies in Burgundy and immediately marched to Paris, uncontested, since I'm pretty sure France has their men off fighting my allies. Paris has no fort, so it fell almost immediately, and well, that was anticlimactic. France is completely crumbling, and although the Ottomans are holding their own, they're irrelevant to my war here in the West. I'm just going to let the Ottomans go and return for some land in Hungary. Why should I care what Austria thinks? Once I take France, I'll be unstoppable. I made peace with Scotland for Lothian and Inverness, so they don't have any forts. I'll finish them off later. Given how easy this war in France is, I declared war on Magdeburg for some Brandenburg cores, since I might as well keep conquering if the wars will be this easy. I grabbed the thrones of France and Naples in April of 1569. I'm going to take a while to integrate France since I can't use the Act of Union on them due to their massive size, but regardless, I'm going to release Ireland with my missions and work on making France loyal. I've got too many diplomatic relations, but quite frankly, I'm so far ahead in every tech, and I've got so much monarch point production that I'll just eat the losses until I can integrate my subjects. Check out that beautiful Brandenburg, by the way. I'm not sure how far I'll take this little vassal, but I'll certainly keep following their mission tree to get free claims on Germany. Due to my aggressive expansion, Burgundy broke our alliance, but you know what? I have missions to conquer them anyway, so screw it. I conquered Scotland in 1582 while improving relations with France and building up my spy network on Burgundy. But you know what? We'll continue this in another video. I really want to see this base Danish Angevin Empire go somewhere, but I don't want to cover too much in one video, so that'll be all for now. We started as the unratified Kalmar Union in Denmark and worked our way towards controlling Lubeck and the Baltic Sea, alongside construction of a powerful enough navy to unseat England. After seizing the very identity of the English people, we've taken up their failed war for France, and with the Empire gone, the Danelaw can go wherever it wants. If you've used this video as a guide, I'll just say that you can definitely accomplish more than this if you're not as lazy as me, but that's up to you. I'm happy with my work here, and hopefully whatever you do, you'll be happy with it too. Thank you for your time.